Hello everyone, I am Shaptadeep Shah, an undergraduate student from India, pursuing my bachelor's in computer science and engineering. I am a research associate in the BMSI's Young Scientist program, working under the mentorship of Dr. Jim Klebs, Dr. Stuart Bertlett, and Dr. Anirudh Prabhu. Today, we will be talking about our project on finding techno signatures in extraterrestrial radio signals. It's a fascinating topic, and I'm glad to be able to talk about that. So, let's get started. Before we deep dive into the technicalities of our project, I would like to ask a question. Are we alone? Are humans the only intelligent species? Are humans the only technologically advanced species? We may not be sure about the answers, but we are sure of one thing. It is the fact that our universe is vast. One of the many things that modern astronomy has done for the humanity is to show us the vastness of our universe. Our Earth is part of the solar system, which is one of the many star systems that exist in our Milky Way galaxy. And then there exist thousands of billions of such galaxies in our universe. This makes our lifetime very tiny in this vast sea of space and time and consequently it becomes exceptionally hard to witness aliens even if they exist. So what is the solution? The solution is data, extraterrestrial data. Specifically speaking, it's extraterrestrial radio signals. Extraterrestrial radio signals are deep gold mines for SETI research. Whenever we talk about extraterrestrial radio signals and SETI research, which stands for Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence, the name that comes in my mind is Breakthrough Listen. In January 2016, the Berkeley SETI Research Center at University of Berkeley started a program called Breakthrough Listen, described as the most comprehensive search for alien communications to date. Resolution is the largest ever scientific research program aimed at finding evidence of civilizations beyond Earth. The program includes a survey of 1 million closest stars to Earth. It scans the center of our galaxy and the entire galactic plane. Beyond the Milky Way, it listens for messages from the 100 closest galaxies to ours. Break to listen employs some of the most powerful telescopes ever built. This includes the 100-meter Robert C. Beard Green Bank Telescope, which looks into the nearby stars and nearby galaxies. Now, this is a steerable radio telescope, which is the largest in the world. Then we have the 64-meter diameter Parkes Telescope, which looks into nearby stars, galaxies, and galactic plane of Milky Way. This is a steerable radio dish, which is the large, second largest in the southern hemisphere. Then we have the automated planet finder telescope at Leak Observatory. Leak's state-of-the-art automated planet finder with its Levy spectrometer is ideal for finding laser communications not in the visible light range, but across the spectrum from near infrared range to near ultraviolet. It looks into the nearby 1000 stars and the nearest 100 galaxies. And then we have the Mead Cat Radio Telescope. It looks into the nearby 1 million stars. The 64 antenna Mead Cat array is the mid frequency precursor telescope for the square kilometer array telescope. It's indeed a powerful telescope in its own light. For now, we would focus on radio signals only. The Break to Listen project has just about everything covered. The only sticking point is the data. Even after compromising on the raw data's time or frequency resolution, Break to Listen is archiving hundreds of GBs of data every hour. The Break to Listen generates over one petabyte of spectrograms per year. The radio telescope receives the radio signals 
and then those raw signals are converted into spectrograms. This is a typical example of a spectrogram of an FM radio signal running from 88.2 MHz to 89.8 MHz. On the x-axis, we have the frequency domain and on the y-axis, we have, we have the time domain. Back to listen generates similar spectrograms, but typically spanning several gigahertz of the radio spectrum compared to the approx 2 megahertz uh, range shown earlier in the spectrogram of the FM radio signal. The data are stored either as filter bank format or HDF5 format, but essentially these are arrays of intensity as a function of time and frequency domain. Now each individual filter bank file can be tens of GVs in size. And the data stored in those filter bank files are created at three different frequency resolutions. These are the high frequency resolution with 3 hertz frequency resolution and 18 second sample time. High time resolution with 366 kilohertz frequency resolution and 349 microsecond sample time. And medium resolution with 3 kilohertz frequency resolution and 1 second sample time. But wait, there is one more problem. The problem is RFI or radio frequency interference. Break the listen is searching for candidate signatures of extraterrestrial technology. And these are referred to as the techno signatures. But there is one more problem. The problem is our only human technology, not just the radio stations, but also the Wi Fi routers, cell phones, and even electronics that are not deliberately designed to transmit radio signals also gives off radio signals. And this causes interference. These human generated signals are thus referred to as radio inter frequency interference or RFI. What's the solution? The solution is to isolate the candidate techno signatures from RFI by looking for signals that appear to be coming from particular positions on the sky. Typically, it is done by alternating observations of a primary target with observations of three nearby locations. So this creates a set of six observations, which is referred to as a cadence. There is another possibility. The relative motion of the arc on the target imports a Doppler drift, which causes the frequency to change over the time. But in case of RFI, there is a tendency to remain at fixed frequency given the fact that most of the RFI sources are based on Earth. So this is an example of a cadence snippet. Here we have the Voyager 1 interpreted spacecraft at our as our target. And as we can see, the target and off-target regions are arranged alternatively. So if we see the yellow line that refers to the Voyager 1 radio signal, it disappears in the off-target region and is only visible in the target region. This refers to the fact that the signal is indeed coming from a specific location in the sky. And then we can also see that the frequency of the signal is also changing over the time, which imports the fact that there is really motion between the target and the earth, which is causing the Doppler drift. This implies the fact that this radio signal is indeed a techno signature other than just being an RFI. But we don't have such many interplanetary spacecraft, right? And we also want to be able to find a wider range of signal types. What's the solution to that? The feasible solution is to simulate our very own classes of techno signature candidates. How it is done? This is done by taking tens of thousands of cadence snippets, which we call the haystack, and we hide needles that is a techno signature among them. So it's basically like hiding needles into the haystack. Some of these needles look similar to the Voyager 1 signal and are easier to be detected, but some are hidden in the noisy region of the spectrum and are harder to be detected. This is a typical example of a such synthetic techno signature. Now, let's talk about the most important part of the project, 
the self supervised learning based reverse radio spectrogram search. What is reverse radio spectrogram search? Basically, it is inspired from the NN vector search architecture, where we have data samples passed to the encoder network, which creates vector embeddings for the samples, which are then stored into the vector database or the vector index. Then we have the query sample passed to the encoder, which is then transformed into a query embeddings, and then we use NN search algorithm to retrieve the top tier results based on a certain vector similarity metric. But for that to work properly, the encoder network needs to be trained to create such meaningful vector embeddings. For that task to be accomplished, we use Bootstrap your own latent or Biol architecture. Biol architecture is a self-service learning algorithm for learning image representations. So this is the structure of the Biol method. We have two networks here, namely online and target network. The online is also referred to as the student network and the target as the teacher network. So we take a sample, create two augmented views of the same sample and pass it to the encoder backbones of the network. Then the output from the encoder backbones are passed to the projector and from the projector to the predicted in case of the online network. And finally, the loss is calculated. The objective is to maximize the similarity of representations of the same sample under a different augmented view. The online network, aka student, has an MLP called predictor, which makes the whole method asymmetric with respect to the target, aka the teacher model. The teacher model is updated only to exponential moving average from the student's parameter. That means that gradients flow only through the student network. Now for the encoder backbones, we use ResNet18 as the base model. We modify it for self supervised learning. And how it is done is by replacing the last layer, which is the classification layer, with an identity function. The output features of ResNet18 are then fed to the MLP projector of the student and the teacher network. Now, tracking down what's happening in self supervised training with canon accuracy. The mean squared error between the L2 normalized predictions and the target predictions is given by the following formula. But the loss in self-supervised learning is not a reliable metric to track the performance of the model. Therefore, we take the help of canon accuracy. The critical advantage of using canon is that we don't have to train a linear classifier on top each time, so it's faster and completely unsupervised. So let's talk about augmentations. Augmentations help in generalization. It helps the encoder, that is a student model, to learn meaningful patterns in the data samples. So this is an example of an augmentation strategy where you, we use denoising autoencoder to generate noise and clean sample pairs by removing noise from original samples. And then this is another way of augmentation where we use time warping time masking and frequency masking on spectrograms. Now, fitting the noise and clean samples generated using the denoising autoencoder to the student and teacher network respectively, we force the student network to learn and focus on the techno signatures, on the meaningful patterns and thus avoid the noise. Using time warping, time masking and frequency masking, help the model to become robust against temporal and frequency variation, ultimately reducing overfitting. Use of spectral resolution augmentation can also help the student model to deal with data samples where the spectral resolution varies, making the model more robust. Now, the final question is, how would our method help? We can use it to look for similar signals in our database and thus discover new signals. We can train a classifier on top of the encoder to classify the signals of interest. We can train a binary classifier on top of the encoder to detect if a certain sample contains techno signatures or not. And finally, we can also employ unsupervised clustering on top of encoder generated embeddings to group similar looking signals, considering new classes of signals which would evolve over the time. And with that, our search for techno signatures continues. Thank you everyone for your time and attention.
Thanks a lot.